Chapter 9, A Relationship, Development and Maintenance. The social nature of people, with their natural need for one another, makes finding and initiating a relationship a relatively easy task for most. We begin to learn about the processes of seeking out and identifying others who attract us from early childhood onwards, establishing relationships with friends, companions, and eventually lovers as part and parcel of our developmental maturation, making contacts and validating the mutual chemistry of loving seem to be natural to humans. But the skill needed to maintain these relationships to the continuing mutual satisfaction and fulfillment of the partners is an entirely different proposition. Although we did have an interest in what attracted men to each other, our principal interest was in what keeps them together. How do they maintain their relationships, their partnerships? We originally assumed that we could find a single factor, like love, or a group of factors. It quickly became obvious that our speculations were naive and incorrect. It should have been obvious that what brings and keeps a couple together in the beginning and during their first year is very different from what keeps them together in their fourth, tenth, or thirtieth year. In fact, we learned that the continued presence of some characteristics of the first year, like mutual possessiveness, if maintained, are serious detriments to the continuation of the relationship. There are different components in the formation and development of the male couple. Some are similar to, but most are different from, those affecting heterosexual and lesbian relationships. For instance, the presence or absence of male bonding is different for gay and non-gay men. Although many of the same factors affect female couples, the unique influence of anti-homosexual attitudes and the process of coming out have their own parts to play in affecting the male couple. What part does social scripting play in their relationships? Gay men frequently vary from the usual social scripting for males. What effect does that have on their relationships? Complementarity is an important feature of all relationships. As you have already seen, gay men begin a relationship with some natural complementation, but more often than not, they must develop it together. Relationship Expectation Society places a high value on relationship formation, specifically marriage for heterosexual persons with the expectation of childbearing and family development. For heterosexual persons, there are only a few acceptable alternatives to marriage, such as religious life. Although there is less pressure and expectation for partnering among gay men, there is still a high value placed on finding a partner and settling down. Gay and non-gay persons alike look upon themselves and are frequently looked upon by others as having problems if they are not involved in a primary relationship. To complement this picture further, the expectation that relationships follow a set pattern of romantic attraction, falling in love, courtship, marriage, and family also has its effect on male couples. Gay men are apt to share these same hidden expectations. Society makes no provision for and has no expectations of a percentage of the population being gay. Gay people, therefore, are expected to follow the norm for non-gay people. Sometimes they try with varying degrees of success. Sometimes they create new patterns, also with varying degrees of success. What does society do to help people? What does society do to help prepare people to fulfill its expectations of marriage or coupling? It provides role models in the form of parents and others relying on assumed, built-in, biological, 
complementarity of opposite genders. It also molds further complementarity between males and females by encouraging the development of skills, emotions, and behaviors, and one to the exclusion of the other, thus ensuring mutual need. Social scripting. One of the ways in which complementarity is established is through a process labeled social scripting by Gagnon and Simon or Gagnon and Simon. Gay men usually depart from the expected male script, but the pressures and influences of social scripting are significant. From the moment of birth, children are taught different attitudes and behaviors that society considers appropriate to their gender. For example, infant boys are treated more roughly than infant girls. There is even an observable difference in the ways mothers talk to their male and female offspring. Broadly painted, males are taught to be goal-oriented, to play or fight to win, to seek conflict and adventure. Contact and competitive sports are encouraged. The male script includes aggressiveness and tight emotional control, exemplified by the popular saying, Big boys don't cry. Men are encouraged to develop confidence, decisiveness, and assurance to be the protector and avenger. The social script for the female is intended to complement that of the male. She is to be submissive, attentive, and nurturing. She is taught to be process-oriented instead of goal-oriented. She learns to be a peacemaker and to settle arguments, not to win them. She is taught social skills and homemaking and is encouraged to make her body attractive to the male. Females, unlike males, are encouraged to express their feelings. In addition to these scripts, society idealizes many masculine traits and endows them with an ordinately high value when compared to female ones. In fact, traditional feminine characteristics are held in contempt by some. If a female deviates from her programmed social script and manifests some masculine traits, she is praised and more highly valued unless she deviates too far and becomes unpleasantly aggressive. In sharp contrast is the male who manifests certain feminine characteristics. He is stigmatized and devalued by his peers and society according to how many of these feminine traits he has and how obviously they are manifested. There are limited acceptance alternative social there are limited acceptance alternative social scripts for males. Young boys who fail to follow the traditional script are in instant social jeopardy, especially with their peers. They are teased and harassed for not conforming. Females, on the other hand, often have been able to get by with more in-between scripting, such as the tomboy who usually enjoys increased social acceptance in childhood and early adolescence. Persons who stray from the cultural scripts encounter special problems. For example, if a macho male and a feminine female marry, the chances of their relationship surviving are greater if both partners maintain their learned scripting. If, on the other hand, the female begins to alter her scripted responses and the male maintains his macho orientation, the marriage can be in trouble. This picture characterizes many contemporary heterosexual couples in which wives have been influenced by the women's liberation movement. In contrast, consider two women forming a relationship with each coming from the same feminine model. Although there may be difficulties without one or both making changes, there is a much greater probability of satisfaction for both. Two women who both listen, nurture, openly express their feelings, and are concerned 
and sensitive would seem to have a firmer basis for relationship satisfaction and survival. Another example, and one more to the point of this study, is a relationship between two macho scripted males. The obvious potential for clash, competition, and dissonance is very high. Such a relationship probably could not endure without one or both changing a great deal. However, the majority of men in this study have strayed from the full macho scripting, although they often suffered ridicule and rejection for these differences while growing up. It is these same developmental differences that become critical ingredients in male couples. There are signs of mild change. Educational trends encourage cooking classes for boys, carpentry for girls, and athletic participation for both. Mainline psychological thinking has begun to isolate masculine and feminine characteristics in both sexes, extolling the values of androgyny, Singer, Bims, Pharrell, Nichols. However, the participants in this study all grew up in the past and a large number report differences from the traditional social scripting for boys. Their average age is 37.5. As we said above, variations on developmental scripting have been beneficial to their current relationships. Variant Social Scripting Sissy is a pejorative label leveled at boys with attributes and behaviors usually ascribed to girls. Sissy usually evokes images of boys jumping rope, playing with dolls, and dressing up in their mother's or sister's clothes. Sissy also connotes characteristics such as passivity, feminine sensitivity, emotionality, and bookishness none of which is part of the usual scripting for boys. These boys did not hew to the traditionally prescribed sets of attitudes and behaviors. More than 75% of the men in this study report being called sissies or seeing themselves as different from other boys at a very early stage. Table 2 Table 2 Playmates before adolescence. Categories, number of participants, percentage of participants. Boys, the number of participants were 203, their percentage 65.0. For girls, the number of participants were 87 or 28.0. Uh, both sexes equally, the number of participants 22, percentage of participants 7. Were you called sissy? No, 73, which is 23.4 percent. Yes, 239, 76.6 percent. Was nudity acceptable in your family? Yes, 44 participants, 14.0 percent. No, 268 participants or 86 percent of the group. A boy who during childhood and adolescence believes himself to be different and is treated differently, especially by his peers, often feels very badly about himself. These are the years when being different is perceived as being wrong. But I really like to jump rope and I was good at it, I might add. It just seems to me that girls' games were far more fun. I hated myself for liking them because the other guys would make so much fun of me. Another participant says, I got called sissy because I was always reading. My dad called me a bookworm, but the other kids would tease me for being clumsy and inept at their games. In another reports, crybaby was what my sisters called me because I hated to see an animal hurt or a bee killed. My sisters would catch butterflies and tear off their wings just to get me upset. 
Some boys are also labeled as sissies for certain effeminate traits that become an affront to sex role scripting. Some men in this study do recall effeminate mannerisms such as wrist, hand, and hip movements or head and body inclinations that they developed in childhood but lost when they became teenagers as a result of parental pressures or peer ridicule. Some continue to carry effeminate characteristics into their adult lives. One participant reports, I haven't thought about it in years, but when I was real young, I was limp-wristed and tended to swish. Then I stopped somewhere before high school because I took such teasing from my family. When I finally came out a few years ago, I turned into a regular queen, taking on every campy mannerism I could. I surprised even myself, but it seemed to be the best and easiest way for me to be in with the boys. Some men in our study do have effeminate characteristics. Some have a few, but the large majority have none. On the other hand, many are quick to mimic, imitate, or exaggerate female mannerisms in what has come to be known as camp behavior or camping it up. Men who enter relationships with other men without being threatened by their own or others' lack of clear-cut gender-related roles and mannerisms do so with a valuable asset that may contribute to the quality and durability of their relationships. While attending an international symposium on gender dysphoria, Coronado, California, February 1979, we heard Reverend Cannon Clinton Jones make an observation that often the campy, effeminate cross-dressing behaviors of gay men are nothing more than the need to sometimes open up the old trunks in the attic, take out the hats and dresses, and put them on to play. The audience roared with laughter and then burst into applause. Some forms of cross-dressing behavior in gay men simply express their liberation from established gender-related roles. Such behavior does not seem to threaten their masculinity and consequently their ability to play with cross-gender expressions increases their repertoire of available fun and games. This is not true for all expressions of camp. Another way society encourages heterosexual relationship formation is by providing patterns or formats for experimentation and rehearsal with romance and falling in love during adolescence. One is expected to experience first limerence. As was explained in chapter 3, limerence is a new word coined by Dorothy Tenov to describe the experience of falling in love with the accompanying obsessive ruminations, rum, ruminations, again, as we explained in chapter 3, limerence is a new word coined by Dorothy Tenov, T-E-N-N-O-V, to describe the experience of falling in love with the accompanying obsessive ruminations, desires for reciprocity, and single-minded intensity. We use the word because it expresses the concept of romantic love as neutrally as possible without the pejorative tones of words such as infatuation and puppy love. When the limerence strikes, emotional and behavioral discharge is available in dating, petting, and similar overt expressions among non-gay adolescents. For the gay male adolescent, experiencing these same feelings for a boy of his own age, there are usually only covert expressions of the feelings of complete suppression. More often than not, the gay adolescent feels guilt, anxiety, and confusion. While he does not experience romantic or sexual feelings with girls, frequently he does go through the motions of dating. Some gay men, therefore, lack the opportunity during their teenage years to experiment with and rehearse their feelings of romance and love for other men. 
It is not unusual to find gay men in their 20s or 30s experimenting with seemingly adolescent relationships. This is not to say that falling in love feelings are limited to adolescence, far from it, but their first appearance usually occurs in this developmental stage. Resistance Theory Society fosters heterosexual coupling by supporting male and female differences. C. A. Tripp advances a theory to explain the importance of these differences. Tripp says that a certain degree of disparity or resistance between partners is necessary for sexual arousal. The gender differences between a man and a woman establish a dominance submission hierarchy and thus provide one form of resistance needed to generate and maintain sexual attraction. Although this resistance can be manifested in far more subtle ways than the obvious disparity between sexes, generally speaking, Tripp believes that some kind of resistance or distancing is necessary for continued sexual activity. In other words, the mystery of the other provides a continual spark of excitement. This theory of resistance implies that as couples develop greater intimacy, closeness, and parity, there is a reciprocal decline in their sexual activity caused by the decline in resistance. The theory further implies that similarities of gay partners diminish the availability of the built-in resistance of opposite genders. Gay couples must generate some source of resistance. Even in men with many similarities in background and socialization who can and do experience high rapport in their early mateships, we find clear evidence that they import and export from each other. That is, each gets from the other what he wants, desires, or needs for himself. This complementarity initially helps foster tension required for ongoing eroticism, but quickly fatigues as a source of resistance. For many gay men, their deviation from the normal social scripting partially explains the development of contemporary skills, feelings, and behaviors that contribute to their relationship. Formation and Continuation The male couples in our study have proven themselves adept at finding unique ways to keep helpful tension alive. Still, the equality and similarities found in male couples are formidable. Obstacles to continuing high sexual vitality in their lasting relationships. Male bonding. In every society and culture, Scrutinized by scientific observation, the curious and uniquely male experience of close-knit group formation is found. These groupings may have clearly purpose, purposive explanations, such as hunting and gathering, protection of the tribe or territory, or merely team formation in competitive sports. But close binding male partnerships and groups form even in the absence of overtly purposeful reasons in order for men to be together, ergo, Lions Club, Masons, fraternities, and other male-only clubs. Within these groups, individual associations between men develop into male friendships. Although the forms and rules vary from culture to culture, the male bond is universally characterized by friendship, loyalty, and affection. Brain trip. In some instances, these friendships are ritualized and lifelong. In some societies, like our own, the bond is acknowledged but is not characterized by intimacy, vulnerability, and sharing of feelings. Among the earliest manifestations of this bonding are the exclusionary playmate selections of boys in childhood and early adolescence. Girls are not only excluded, but boys openly express aversion to them and their presence. A function of the bonding, or at least one of its effects, is the learning of female attitudes and behaviors, and the internalization and solidification of a masculine self-image. Within these childhood and adolescent peer groups, the developing male ego is molded 
and sculpt it by social scripting, more often than not learning toward the most macho attributes as representative of the societal ideal. There are expectations, there are exceptions to this pattern. For instance, the loners, leaders, and often the geniuses who isolate themselves from the world also avoid this male bonding. If male bonding is such a ubiquitous phenomenon, as much assuredly it is, what part, if any, does it play in the formation and maintenance of male homosexual relationships? In the preceding section on socialization, we indicated that many of the men in our study do not fit the stereotypically expected model. Other research data, Green, Money, and Earhart, indicate that boys who select opposite-sex playmates in childhood more likely are more likely to be homosexual. Although these data do not make playmate selection a causative factor in the development of a homosexual object choice, there is some implication of it. We believe that in boys with effeminate childhood traits and opposite sex playmate selection, the eroticizing of male attributes already has occurred and is probably more responsible for the behavior than the opposite being the case. We strongly suspect that the presence of or absence of male bonding is connected with the development of a homosexual orientation among men. We do not intend to imply a causal connection, but we do speculate that the early eroticizing of male attributes blocks male bonding because boys do not bond with persons they eroticize. Similarly, non-gay boys do not bond with girls. The development of sexual attraction to the same or to the opposite sex requires eroticizing the attributes of one or the other. This issues this issue touches on the roots of sexuality, that is, what makes a person heterosexual or homosexual. The origins of homosexuality, as well as those of heterosexuality, are multiple. Whether homosexual attraction is prenatal and inborn, parents-induced, environmentally acquired, or socially learned, its appearance occurs at different times for different persons. Among the homosexual men in this study, there is a wide variation in the times of life when they recognize their homoerotic attraction and engaged in homosexual behavior. Some men report awareness of their erotic attraction to males at very early ages, such as five or six, while others do not experience that awareness until adolescence or even later. The earlier the eroticizing occurs, the less likely it is that the male will have experienced male bonding. Those men who have the earliest recollections of attraction to males apparently failed to make close-knit associations with other boys, and thus their developing ego formation was not influenced by the powerful molding forces of peer conformity. In those men, whose awareness of eroticizing occurred later, early male bonding was part and parcel of their internalized development. At the point or time period in which eroticizing occurred, however, the probability of male bonding diminished or became impossible as a consequence of the predominant force and influential power of sexual attraction. Setting aside this discussion for a moment, what can be said about the inherent possibility of sexual attraction occurring within the context of the male bond? Assuming the biological and psychological theories of the intrinsic bisexual nature of humans, setting aside this discussion for a moment, what can be said about the inherent possibility of sexual attraction occurring within the context of the male bond? Assuming the biological and psychological theories of the intrinsic bisexual nature of humans, Freud, Scherfe, the possibility for each individual to eroticize his or her own or the opposite gender would seem to provide male bonding with a natural incubator for the development of homosexuality. Actually, the opposite appears to be true. 
Male bonding provides the matrix for the expression and fulfillment of men's homosexual needs, which are far less genitally erotic than their heterosexual needs. Bonding propels them in a satisfied state toward erotic fulfillment heterosexually. The existence of strong peer and societal taboos against homosexual behaviors is a further bulwark against the development of homosexuality and supports the establishment of a heterosexual orientation. The presence and availability of lifelong male bonding serves to satisfy homosexual needs minimally, sometimes inadequately, without the expression of frank and open sexuality. In the face of the failure of fulfillment in the male bond, apparently large numbers of heterosexual men seek homosexual genital outlets on occasion while living seemingly fulfilled lives as heterosexuals. Humphreys found that more than 50% of the males seeking homosexual sex in public places were heterosexual. Kinsey's research showed that close to 50% of men who had homosexual outlets between adolescence and age 50. Kinsey's research showed that close to 50% of men had homosexual outlets between adolescence and age 50. With the possibility of erotic expression within the male bond established, the original question about the part it plays in male homosexual relationships takes on increased significance. We find that male bonding is far less important in gay couples than is the fulfillment of the need for erotic expression. Among some couples, we do find evidence supporting the presence of male bonding, while in others we could find none. The initial formation of male homosexual relationships is highly dependent upon eroticizing the partner's attributes, whether physical, psychological, or spiritual. In such early relationship formation, the absence of male bonding seems to be more critical than its presence. However, as relationships pass through stages, the re-emergence of male bonding certainly contributes to the stability and longevity of some. Anti-Homosexual Attitudes Responses to homosexual behavior vary greatly from culture to culture. Its expression between males within the male bond is tolerated and even encouraged by some cultures. Some even institutionalize it in puberty rites and ceremonies of manhood. Others have implicit or explicit rules against it. Our Western cultures incorporate and institutionalize, and institutionalize vehicles for the expression of the male bond that attempt to exclude the potential sexual and erotic components. In The Male Machine, Festo discusses the American male's difficulty in dealing with tender and affectionate feelings. A major source of these inhibitions is the fear of being or being thought homosexual. Nothing is more frightening to a heterosexual man in our society. It threatens at one stroke to take away every vestige of his claim to a masculine identity. Something like knocking out the foundations of a building and to expose him to the ostracism ranging from polite tolerance to violent revulsion of his friends and colleagues. A man can be labeled as homosexual not just because of overt sexual acts, but because of almost any sign of behavior which does not fit the masculine stereotype. The participants in our study have been reared and live in a culture with strong anti-homosexual attitudes. These special and unique circumstances are not are really not comparable to any other minority group because the attitudes are shared not only by the larger society and all of its institutions, but also by parents, families, and in many instances, the men themselves. In addition to homophobia, which is described in the quotation from Festo above, we have identified three other categories of anti-homosexual attitudes each of which affects the process of male-male relationship formation, the prejudice, ignorance, and oppression 
the additional complication of sexual repression not in the personal psychoanalytic use of the term but closer to the societal sense in which Foucault uses the term in the history of sexuality is shared by participants with the wider society of mankind the anti-homosexual attitudes of our culture however are supported and intensified by the more generalized evidence of sexual negativity that is partially de re de derived from the repression. Homophobia. Any living language allows for the formation of new words to express or define experience, things, or people. The neologistic tendency is nowhere more prevalent than in psychology and modern technology. However, one of the difficulties with the introduction of new words into the language is the stabilization of their meanings so that the function of language the communication of ideas can be served faithfully faithfully the invention of the word homophobia came at a point in time shortly after the emergence of the gay liberation movement although intended as a psychological term to mean fear of being or being thought gay in fear of gays, it was quickly incorporated into gay liberationist language as a political epithet to be hurled as an insult at any and all opposition to the progress of gay of the gay rights movement. This extended popularization of the word has diluted its significance in some cases and in some cases obscured other anti homosexual attitudes. While recognizing the value and importance of fear as a protective and motivational emotion, as Kessler has noted, its presence in phobic proportion becomes debilitating in many instances. Isolated phobic reactions such as claustrophobia, fear of heights, fear of the dark, or fear of snakes can be managed by avoidance or by mastery. The much more subtle fear of being homosexual can manifest itself in personality defense mechanisms. Some mechanisms may function quite well for individuals through isolation of effect, of affect, projection, rationalization, or even reaction formation. For many persons, however, the defense mechanisms themselves, which are protecting the person from feeling guilty, shame or anxiety caused by his intrapsychic conflict over homosexual wishes impulses or behaviors become detrimental or and debilitating in his life his work and especially his relationships prejudice prejudice is defined here as the prejudging irrational attitude of hostility toward gay men and women although there may be some ignorance involved even when the missing knowledge is supplied the hostility continues prejudice implies a strong emotional component that cannot be removed by learning more about the subject studies have shown that prejudice is overcome best when knowledge is accompanied by an experiential and emotional involvement with the person or group against whom the prejudice is held this has been demonstrated in the case of blacks with prejudicial attitudes of non-blacks. This has been demonstrated in the case of blacks when prejudicial attitudes of non-blacks have disappeared with the formation of friendship links. Ignorance. Lack of knowledge is included in our list of anti-homosexual attitudes because we have discovered that the perpetuation of long-held negative myths about gays, even among gays themselves, is often sustained by ignorance. Information gaps are caused by the lack of research on the subject, ineffective dissemination, and resistance to reading the accurate data that are available. Two of the old myths that homosexual men do not have lasting relationships and that they are child molesters still carry surprising weight among gays and non-gays alike. Oppression, the unjust exercise of power and authority over others is a facet of life which we have become more conscious today. 
blacks, women, Jews, Arabs, Poles, the list is seemingly endless, all have experienced oppression by the majority of society. The truth is that many homosexual individuals who have not been visible or open about their sexual orientation have never even reflected on the possibility of being oppressed. The increasing visibility of homosexual people has called attention to particular aspects of oppression, such as in federal employment, military service, and teaching. The fact of the matter is that some gay persons have held all the positions and jobs from which they would be excluded had their sexual orientation been known or not been deliberately overlooked. Self-oppression is an issue when gay people themselves assume that they will receive prejudicial treatment from others and act accordingly. Coming out. Coming out is the phrase used to describe the process and events surrounding a person's awareness and disclosure of his or her homosexuality. People who are not open have been described as being in the closet, and the term coming out carries the connotations of coming out of the closet. Other researchers and writers have postulated steps in the process of coming out among gays. Warren. Cass, Coleman, Denk. Although we generally find agreement with the observations of others, our research resulted in identifying the following five steps of coming out. 1. Self-recognition as gay. 2. Disclosure to others. 3. Socialization with other gay people. 4. Positive self-identification. 5. Integration and acceptance. These steps are not necessarily linear in their progression. Coming out is not a one-time event. Self-recognition as gay. The first phrase, the first phase, is more than having an awareness of attraction to same-sex persons. In fact, many persons may engage in homosexual behaviors in childhood, adolescence, and even adulthood without ever recognizing themselves as gay. The obverse is also true where persons may never engage in such behaviors either before or after their self-recognition as homosexual. More often than not, this self-recognition is accompanied by certain sub-phases usually initial denial with attempts at suppressing the feelings and fantasies, then a process of bargaining about it within the self by trying to develop romantic and sexual feelings with the opposite sex, by seeking counseling or by using religion to block the feelings. For some gay people, self-recognition or self-labeling comes early and easily, but for most it is a struggle. Disclosure to others. This step has many variations, but its common theme is the time at which the person either overtly or covertly lets his self-recognition be known to others, usually significant others such as family members, a close friend, a therapist, a minister, or a teacher. The first disclosure may be a halting one. It may be taken back a number of times before the person becomes comfortable sharing his sexual orientation. First disclosures may be to other gays and may occur after sexual exploits or visits to gay bars, baths, or discos. The response of the person to whom the disclosure is made becomes important in the process of coming out, rejection may retard further disclosures, and acceptance may facilitate more risk-taking. Initial rejection also may push the person back toward the first phase, accompanied by self-doubt and questioning. Covert disclosures may take the form of introducing male lovers to family, leaving evidence of an interest in homosexuality in places where it will be found, books, articles, magazines, and so on. However, disclosure is made, it is an important step 
that must be taken. Disclosure must be made to some significant other, even though family and former close friends may not be the first to learn about it. In fact, they may never learn about it. Socialization with other gay people. This phase may precede or follow disclosure, but the steps involved in socialization with others is a vital one that influences both thoughts and feelings about being gay. Initially, most gay persons feel they are totally alone with their gayness, and the discovery of others like them affects their thoughts and feelings about themselves. The development of self-identity and acceptance is greatly advanced by support and validation from other members of the same stigmatized group. Replacing former negative ideas and feelings with positive experiences with others like themselves who are happy and well-adjusted makes a necessary bridge in the process of coming out. Positive self-identification. In using this term, we do not intend to open a discussion on the issue of identity and the attendant points of view about it. What we mean is the positive identification of the self as gay accompanied by the ability to express the self in fulfilling and satisfying ways. This kind of self-identification requires knowledge about gays and homosexuality that replaces prior ignorance and bias. It requires positive feelings and experiences that mitigate against the prejudice and the homophobia. It means moving in the direction of total self-acceptance, regardless of the means one chooses to express the self. The self-identified gay person may still be particularly in the closet or may be completely out of the closet. The final determinant of a positive self-identity is found within the quiet confines of each person's personality, how he feels about himself and how he acts with those feelings. Integration and Acceptance this phase of coming out is more dependent upon the presence of the other phases than any of the previous four. The variations in the ways this phase is manifest are multiple. A major characteristic of acceptance and integration is the taken for granted without any fuss attitude held by those who have achieved this status. For some, this may mean publicly open and non-defensive for some, this may mean being publicly open and non-defensive about sexual orientation. Some are moved to take active roles in advocacy causes. Some are moved to taking active roles in advocacy causes for other gays, while others live their lives quietly without announcing or even reflecting upon their gayness, but always willing to be open and not needing to deny it. The myth commonly held by gay men and others is that coming out is a single process or a step that is taken in a one-time occurrence. Nothing could be further from the facts as revealed by our study. Men slip back and forth in the phases of coming out. I was pretty open about being gay in high school. Then when I got to college, I was right back in the closet. In fact, I was dating girls again and almost got married. I was so mixed up about it for so long that my closet had a revolving door in it. I was out to a few friends, then not to others, then denying it, then being an activist. It took my relationship with my lover to finally get it all together. In addition to this vacillation, there are many sub-phases of coming out. The instance, for instance, making a contact with another man for sex may precede discussing it or disclosing the fact to someone else or vice versa. Several men tell us of making the disclosure to another person with great hesitation only to discover that that person was himself gay and a willing sexual partner. The steps of coming out are not clearly linear in their unfolding. Sometimes an individual may be in step three, not passing through step two until later. The last two steps also have considerable variety in their manifestations. 
We've been living together for almost 14 years. Tom thinks the neighbors don't know about our relationship, but they always see us as a couple. But we're still in the closet to some and out mainly to other gays. Although Tom and Jack think they are still in the closet, it seems to us that it was true only in their attitudes about it and not in the reality of their everyday lives. The two men are seen by everyone as the couple they are. Conclusion Research has yet to identify all of the components important in relationship formation and development. A series of subtle, less obvious, and even controversial factors may underlie relationship formation. Unconscious motivations ranging from father-son and brother-brother to more primitive mother-child dependencies and need satisfactions have been postulated for gay and non-gay couples alike. Hero worship, master, slave, and child parents are only suggestive of a few combinations of individual intrapsychic dynamics that may be important in that first attraction, which may grow and cum culminate in the conception of a relationship. We are also aware that the developing relationship that houses two individuals may be discovered to be inappropriate to the natural growth of one or both of these or those individuals. At those times, separation from the relationship becomes necessary, if painful, lest the development of one or both persons be undermined. This runs contrary to the time-honored view that a person should commit themselves to a relationship for life no matter what the outcome. We recognize that both individuals who constitute a couple have nature's mandate to grow or to stagnate and die. Only two growing individuals can form the vital couple that gives birth to a relationship. End of chapter 9